collaboration is where Collaboration is where people work together to achieve more than they could on their own, working towards a shared goal. So it allows us to see things from other people's perspectives, it allows us to be more creative and also to improve the overall quality of our work and our lives. So how do we develop these skills in the classroom? Teachers need to think carefully about how they set up and structure their activities, not just leave students to work it out for themselves. So project-based tasks or tasks that require students um, to make a group decision are really useful for collaboration. And to get the most out of these activities, teachers can help set them up by giving clear goals and clear steps um, to develop these collaboration skills. Hi everyone, nice to have you back here. We are going to start in a few minutes our last webinar. <coughs> Sorry. My name is Anata Simões. This is the second day of the Cambridge Day 2020. We've been talking all, all day so much about how network collaboration is essential during times of uncertainty. And guess who? I'm trying to not laugh, but Every time I went live here, there is a cat that I know that a few of you already commented on chat trying to to be on air. So sorry that I lost my attention, my focus. Not, 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 now it's time for me to go back and leave the cat. So we've been talking so much about how collaboration is actually essential during times of uncertainty, times like this we are living now that we must praise our next speaker, not only for being the co-author of Own It, uh, Cambridge University Press, new course for teens, but also because she's in Spain, where it's, uh, he lives in Spain, and now it's almost 11 p.m., so he's also collaborating with us. Welcome, Dan Vincent. Uh, I think that your microphone is off, because I can hear you. Can you hear me now? Yes! Mm -hmm. See collaboration times of uncertainty that's Well, first of all, thank you for being here with us. I know uh, that you are going to share a little bit of your experience and passion on teaching. Uh, I know that, thank you again for staying up so late. Uh, could, you, okay. uh, uh, could you talk a little bit? Uh, could you do a small introduction for us and then talk a little bit about your webinar and actually could you talk a little bit about how is uh, life in Spain right now and then start your webinar. Thank you very much for being here with us. That's okay. You've introduced me as being the last and it's very, it's very late in Spain. It's, uh, it's 10.30, but actually Spain is a very late night culture. So it's still quite early in Spain. People <laughs> are just starting to go out to eat or to, to go out for the evening. It's very, very yeah. hard as well. So most things are happening later at night. Um, yeah, I'm from. I'm originally from London, um, uh, but I've lived in different places. I lived in Japan for quite a long time, in Tokyo and in the countryside, back in London for a while, and I've now been in Madrid for about 10 years, uh, teaching English and working with Cambridge for the last few of those. Uh, and I'm going to be talking today about um, teaching teenagers. I'm. I've been. I teach teenagers myself. I teach primary school children, teenagers, and adults. So during the quarantine here in Spain, everything went online, as I'm sure it has uh, in everybody else's uh, country and workplace. Um, so some of the ideas from today are ideas I've tried out with actual teenagers that I've been teaching as well. That's what I'm going to say. Your, your webinar is like engaging activities for online sessions with them. Probably you already tried a few of them, right? I have. I have tried them. Some of them, yeah. Well, most of them actually, yeah. Please be welcome and enjoy. Okay. Okay. Let's, uh, let's start then. Okay. Um, so uh, it's very nice to be here. Um, I was in Brazil last year and I hope to, to visit again at some point. Uh, but in the meantime, being online and seeing everyone online and interacting with you all uh, is, is just as good. So this is what we're going to do today. We're going to look at a number of uh, activities, as I said, which I have uh, tried with my own teenage students over the last few months of, of online teaching through the quarantine. And in particular, uh, we're going to look at um, these things. We're going to look at the power of polls. Um, most um, 
platforms that are used for teaching online have a poll function. Uh, and I'm going to show you different ways that you can use polls to engage learners. In the absence of a poll function, you can use the chat function. So we're going to be using the chat, uh, the live chat today to do some of these activities. Then we're going to look at web quests, uh, uh, what a web quest is, and some examples of things that you can do, again, to engage your students and to um, have them more involved with the lesson. Uh, something which I'll explain later on, jigsaw dictations and jigsaw readings, uh, which you may already be familiar with from teaching uh, in an actual classroom. Um, but also these can be done online, and we'll look at those. Uh, a show and tell, which some of you may know from uh, American kindergarten or movies that show scenes in American schools. And finally, an example of a project, because I think online projects are still, uh, it's still important to try and do project work with teenagers. It works well offline, and it can work well online. And I'm going to give an example of a project that you can do. So those are the things we're going to look at today. Hopefully, uh, you'll be able to take some of these away and, um, and try them out yourselves. But before we do, um, I'd like to find out a little bit about what you think about teaching teenagers. So I would like you to share that with me by doing the following. I'd like you to go to the following website. It's uh, www.menti.com. And it will ask you to enter a code, which is 211270. And then once you've done that, it will ask you to enter a word to complete the sentence, teaching teenagers uh, can be. So please go to menti.com. Please enter the following code, 21, 12, 70, and then choose one word uh, that comes to mind for teaching teens. Okay. And then I'm going to share the results with you, and we'll see what people say. Okay. So. So I'm just going to change screens here for a moment, and then we can uh, hopefully see some of the results. Okay, we have, hopefully you can see uh, a word cloud forming. We've got challenging in the middle, um, exciting, boring. Uh, some of the words are getting smaller. Uh, hard, definitely hard. Funny, it can definitely be funny. Frustrating, um, a challenge is coming up quite frequently. Um, what else do we have there? Getting very small, um, fantastic, interesting, uh, enjoyable. What else can I say? Lots and lots of different words there. Um, this shows the range of emotions, I think, that teaching teenagers can stir in us. It can definitely be, it's definitely very, very challenging. And teaching teenagers online uh, adds, I think, to that challenge. It's definitely added um to to my sense of challenge over the last few months but it can also be in the middle i see that uh, the word rewarding is there it's larger than the other words which means that lots of people are typing that in which is is great to hear or great to see uh, it can be definitely rewarding teenagers can be difficult very difficult to teach at times their their attentions can be focused on anything but english grammar or the topic that you're trying to work on in class. They can be very, very uh, away in their own world, but they can also be incredibly engaged. Uh, they can bring a lot of energy, a lot of um, uh, ideas to the class, and it can be very rewarding and it can be exciting as well. So I'm really pleased to see that overall, um, I think the word cloud that's forming shows us that it's a lot of, um, a lot of positive uh, feeling towards teaching teenagers there, okay. I'll just let this go uh, for another few moments so that you can see um, funny comes up quite a lot. I've definitely got some very funny teenagers uh, who've made me laugh a lot over the last few um, few months. Exciting. Um, it can be very exciting to see them progress and when they're engaged and um, you feel that uh, whatever you've planned as a lesson is really working, it can be very exciting to see that sense of their sense of achievement um okay difficult yes well hopefully the less some of the activities that we'll do today will uh help to make it uh an easier ride okay so um let's go back now to my presentation just a moment and we'll look at some activities 
that we can do in class. So uh, we did that and we saw lots of uh, interesting words. Challenging and rewarding are definitely the two that stick out for me. Uh, we're going to look at the power of holes. Now, over the last few months, I've been using Zoom as the platform that I teach on. Um, there is a whole variety of platforms, and most of them have a poll function where you can prepare a poll and then launch it during the lesson uh, and have the participants respond uh, there and then. In the absence of a poll, you can use the chat function, the live chat function, uh, and that's what we're going to be using uh, in this session. I'm going to give you some examples of ways that you can use the poll to make the lesson more interactive and to make the lesson more engaging. So I'd like you to, uh, let's do the first one. The first one is a short text, which I would like you to read. And I would like you to choose the missing words and uh, type your answer into the live chat. So you have four options there. One, nevertheless, both. Two, furthermore, either. Three, nevertheless, either. And four, furthermore, and both. So I'm going to go back to and see. Uh, in a moment, hopefully, we should start to see some words appear. And I'm going to talk to you a little bit about, about the text as well. OK. Let's just give that a few moments. I'll read the text with the gaps while we're waiting. Um, modern technology has given us a wide range of additional tools for teaching and learning languages. Gap. The fundamentals of good teaching haven't changed, such as proper lesson planning, learner engagement, teacher responsiveness to individual strengths and weaknesses, and so on. It can be tempting to be gap, dazzled or deterred by our shiny new tools, but they should always support good teaching rather than replace it. Okay. Okay, so lots of answers are coming in now. Most people have chosen three. I'm going to just give you a moment to uh, add your answer. Let me go uh, back to the... Okay, so most of you are choosing three, and indeed three is the answer, nevertheless or either. This is one example of the way that you can use a, uh, a poll option, or as we saw, the chat option, simply to do a very standard uh, multiple choice activity. In this case, practicing um, some grammatical uh, words, nevertheless, either, uh, etc. Um, I'm going to show you some other ways to use polls, but before I do, I'd just like to focus a little bit on this uh, this idea that I have written in the text. Um, I've noticed over the last few months um, of going online and teaching that um, some of my colleagues have really taken to teaching online. They've really they've enjoyed it. Uh, they've really explored the different tools, the platforms. Um, the web pages, the different kinds of applications that are available for teaching languages. Um, and they've played with it, they've explored it, they've tried different things out. And I've done the same to a large extent. Um, but it can be tempting sometimes, I think, to think that the technology uh, is the lesson and that, the, that if something um, dazzling is happening on the screen, that the students will be engaged and will automatically be learning. And that's not really the case. The, the technology can help us to teach better, um, but the basics of teaching, I think, remain the same online and offline. Um, and I think it's important to bear in mind that the, the different tools should support what we already want to do. Uh, and we should start from, from that base, those basics and then include the technology. At the same time, a lot of my colleagues have been quite um, nervous about going online. I was as, uh, at the beginning as well. They've been unsure whether or not the technology would work or if they'd be able to use the technology, uh, perhaps anxious that they wouldn't be able to plan the class or control the class dynamic in the same way online as they do offline. Um, and I think, and I had some of those concerns as well. And I think uh, it helps as well when you have that kind of mindset or you have those kind of, uh, of concerns. Also to remember that the skills that make the skills that we have for teaching in an ordinary classroom, the the knowledge that we have, the experience that we have, that make us teachers and hopefully make us good teachers, are uh, at the core of what makes good teaching. And those are just as applicable online as they are offline. And that can definitely help, I think, to overcome some of the concerns with teaching online. 
Anyway, that was a little bit of a tangent. Uh, let's move on to another way of using polls. This was a grammar uh, multiple choice. Here is a collocation, so this is vocabulary. I'd like you to complete the collocation, I'm blank and tired of my neighbors playing loud music at all hours of the night. Is it A, ill, B, low, C, sick, or D, bored? I feel like a game show host doing this a little bit. Um, so please type in either the word or the letter to show your answer. Let me see if I can see some of those answers coming up. Okay, um, good, good. Okay, yep, people are answering. I'll just give you another moment to go through. I was very pleased to see at the beginning that there were people from all over. I was expecting um, only to see people from Brazil, but I noticed people logging in from uh, Mexico. I saw them logging in from Australia. Uh, there was a couple um, from, uh, there was someone from Cuba, I think, as well. Uh, and it was really exciting to see just before this session started, people logging in from all over. Um, okay, let's go back to the presentation. Indeed, the answer is sick, which is what most of you chose. Okay, another one. Um, a little bit more challenging, perhaps. Which of these words is the odd one out? Is it rude, surly, discourteous, affable, or impolite? Again, you can type in the uh, answer, or you can type in the word. Okay, so I'll just give you a moment to answer that. Uh, with most of my teenage students, we would do uh, simpler vocabulary depending on their level. But I thought if this is a session for English teachers, we should do something slightly more challenging. Okay, so I can see that uh, lots of you are choosing four. Okay, a couple of other numbers. Okay. Okay, so uh, the answer to this is indeed four. It's affable. Um, the others are synonyms of rude, and affable is more like friendly or approachable. So as we saw in the previous one with the collocation sick and tired, and here with the odd one out, again, you can use the poll function or even the chat function to do a very simple multiple choice activity with the entire class. Uh, and again, um, hopefully you felt just in the last few minutes, a little bit more engaged in, in this webinar. Uh, and I think that translates to our students as well, that they feel a little bit more engaged in a very a way that is really simple for the teacher to, to set up uh, and very uh, easy and quick to do in class. So we looked at some grammar and some vocabulary uh, questions. Here is something slightly different. According to the third edition of the Cambridge Encyclopedia of the English Language, which was published in 2019, how many speakers of English, native and non-native, are there worldwide? Okay, so is it A, 1.8 billion? Is it B, 2.3 billion? Or C, 2.7 billion? Let me uh, go to see what people are coming up with. There's no prize at the end, I'm afraid. Someone has put a hmm, which I think is to, Jesse Vidal has put hmm, which I think is to express that uh, they're thinking about the question or they're thinking about the answer. Okay. Uh, I don't know is a perfectly okay answer. Not sure is a perfectly okay answer. Um, I didn't know this either until I listened to a, uh, an interesting podcast recently. Um, it's always fine if people don't know the answers uh, and your students don't know the answer. Okay, so. Oh, there, 2.3 billion is the answer. Um, interestingly, the number of uh, speakers of English is increasing all the time, <clears throat> but the rate of increase is actually going down. Um, but it's still a very large number. It's still a very large number. Moving on. Uh, here is an actual opinion poll where you can express your feelings about this statement. Learners should be encouraged to speak only in English throughout the lesson, even at low levels. How far do you agree? And I've given you uh, four options. I strongly agree, I agree, I disagree, or I strongly disagree. Okay, let's see 
uh, what people think about this. Where am I? Streamyard. Oh no. Go to. There we are. Okay, I can see lots of different com answers coming up. Okay. Okay, so definitely there's a range of opinion here. Some of you uh, agree, some of you disagree. Haven't really seen many uh, strongly agrees or strongly disagrees. Let me go back to the presentation. Okay. Uh, here, obviously, there's not a correct answer, but this is a great way to um, start a discussion in class and um, to, to gauge the general feeling about a topic with your learners. It worked really well with my teenage students uh, on a range of topics, uh, a lot to do with the quarantine and how they felt about some of the restrictions uh, and so on, um, certain aspects of learning online and so on and so forth. Um, and unlike the chat function that we have here often with the polls uh the answers can be anonymous um so the students can can respond without feeling that they're responding publicly and then you just have an idea okay most of the class agree some people disagree and that can be a really good springboard for further discussion and it's a really uh, a good way to i think set up and introduce a discussion that you want to have in class on a particular topic again using um well, using an opinion poll in the way that they were originally intended to be used to gauge uh, gauge opinion. Let's move on to the next one. Uh, we won't we won't go into this topic about only English in class. Although my response would be that um, I agree. I agree, uh, but I think it's okay to use some of the first language too. Here's another thing you can use with polls. If you bumped into one of your learners at a party, how do you think they would react? A, they would say hello. B, they would pretend not to know me. C, they would hide. D, they would scream. Now, I would like to think mine would all say hello, and I, I think the majority of them would say hello to me. Um, but I can also think of one or two who might pretend not to know me, and one or two who would either hide seriously or uh, hide just to be silly. But hopefully most of them would say hello. I hope the, the same can be said of your students. Let's, uh, let's see. Okay, oh, I've got a lot of very friendly students here. Most of them seem to be saying hello. <laughs> some, some would be hiding. Oh, we've got someone who has students who would scream. Oh dear, okay. Generally, however, it's nice to see that most of you think your students would say hello. Uh, Someone has put uh, A would A and D, it depends. So some would say hello, some would scream. Um, some of mine would scream hello. Okay, let's go back to the presentation. A good range of, uh, oh, okay. Um, now, this is, you may have noticed there's a particular grammatical structure here. This is a great way to introduce, in this case, the second conditional uh, using a poll. Um, the, the question is in the second conditional and the answers are using the second condition as well. If you bumped, how would they react? They would, they would, they would, they would. Uh, and using the poll in this way is a great way to uh, present or to introduce a grammatical structure. Uh, as always, it's really important to go meaning first and then structure. So here the students uh, are going, as you were, I hope, uh, um, concentrating on, on the, the question and the answers and which answer they think is appropriate for them and responding in that way. Um, and then you can move into a discussion of the second conditional or more grammatical presentation, if you like. But polls can also be used in this way to introduce grammatical uh, structures, etc. It could be, for example, um, I don't know, uh, with have you ever, have you ever, and then they can have more than one option. Have you ever been in a cave, climbed a mountain, done a bungee jump, uh, and again, People react first to the meaning, and then you can come back and look at the structure later. So polls are a great way to, to do some kind of grammatical work as well, or at least to introduce structures that you need to focus on. 
Okay, finally, we've got one more poll activity. I would like you to imagine you're a high school student yourself. Now, for some of you, that will be quite recent. For others, it may be a little while ago. For me, it's, it's quite a long while ago. Um, and your English teacher has given you a choice, given your class a choice of topics for a discussion essay. Which of these topics do you prefer to write about? In remembering you're a high school student in this scenario. A, life is more stressful for teenagers today than it was 30 years ago. Medical professionals deserve higher pay than professional footballers. And it's important for young people to maintain a good social media image. Let's see which ones you prefer to uh, talk about. Okay. As I expected, a real, a real um, variety of opinion here. Okay. Um, I've done all of these with my, my teenage students. The one that most of them chose most recently was the first one, life is more stressful for teenagers today than it was 30 years ago. And they agreed that it was much, much more stressful. Now, whether that's true or not, I'm not sure, but they, they all said it was much more stressful. And to be fair to them, I think they had a very stressful time uh, during the quarantine, not being able to meet their friends, uh, not being able to socialize, which uh, is really important when you're that age. Um, this example of an activity you can do with a poll is a way to include your students in uh, allowing them to choose uh, either the content of an activity or the direction of some of the activities. I think it's really good, I think it's really important rather, as far as possible to try to involve students a little bit in what they're learning. So not simply to dictate what they're going to do and then doing it, but to take into account uh, the topics that interest them, uh, to give them a little bit of choice over what they do, uh, to involve them in the selection of activities, etc. Uh, that really helps to engage students. I think we all learn much better when we feel we are in control of our learning. And in order for that to be the case with our students, I think it's really important to give them uh, some element or some degree of, of choice. In this case, it was the choice of the topic. We chose it as a um, the whole class would work on the same topic so that we could do some preparation together. But again, they feel that they've selected it, uh, they've chosen it. Some of them chose uh, other numbers two and number three, but there was a democratic sense as well that, okay, most of us want to do number one, let's do number one. Um, it could be, for example, that you have two or three units of a textbook coming up. One of them is in technology, one of them is on uh, travel, uh, and one of them is on wildlife. Um, and you only have time to do two of those before the end of term. You could ask your students, which of the two topics do they, of those three do they want to do? And then involve them in that way. And again, the poll is an ideal way to just do this very, very simply and gives the students an immediate sense of, of feeling more engaged. Um, at least that's been my experience uh, in class as well. I mean, you would do this in ordinary class as well. So just to summarize uh, the different, thank you for responding so well to all those, by the way. It was nice to see such a lot of activity in the chat. Um, to summarize, polls can be used to present and practice grammar and vocabulary. They can be used to introduce a topic or information. We look to the number of speakers of English. Uh, to set up discussions and debates. This was about uh, only using English in class, but it could be any topic that you're, you wish to do with your students. Uh, and to involve learners in deciding the lesson and the course content in the previous essay example. Okay. so. That's uh, lots of activities. Hopefully you'll be able to use some of those online. And even when you go back to the ordinary classroom, I think the basic principles of giving your students choice um, and presenting language in that way is still really useful. We're gonna move on to WebQuest now. Uh, most of you, I think probably have done a WebQuest uh, either yourself or you've had your students do one. It's very simple. It's to set, uh, the idea is that you give students a question which they go off and investigate, try to find the answers online. I'm going to do a very quick example with you here and then talk a little bit more about um, how to do them more fully. I would like you to find the answers online to one of these questions. And then when you have find the answer, found the answer, just type it into the chat. The first one, number one, approximately how many, approximately how many languages are spoken in the world today? Uh, you can find out the answer to that question or 
what was the first language spoken in space? So choose one of those. I'll give you a few minutes or a couple of minutes just to quickly look up the answer online and then, and then uh, report back with the answer. You can see from these questions that a particular <laughs> interest of mine is languages in general. I've, I've always worked uh, either as an English teacher, now writing materials for, for Cambridge, um, and I've, um, my master's as well was in endangered languages. So languages other than English uh, interest me a lot as well. Okay. Uh, okay, I'm just gonna give you a moment more because some of you are coming up with the uh, more, yes, more than a thousand, <clears throat> definitely. Okay, give you a moment to come up with the answers. It's actually very hard to count languages and, a, and an interesting thing to maybe look up after the session is, is why we don't know exactly how many languages there are spoken in the world. It's very, uh, there are languages being spoken that we are not aware of. And also it's very hard sometimes to distinguish between two languages. But most of you have come up with uh, number one, 6,500, uh, which is the generally the general figure. It's between 6,000 and 7,000. Um, so if you if you had it in that ballpark, then that's uh, that's correct. There's no exact answer, but it's between six and 7,000 linguists uh, believe or linguists think. And the second one was Russian. Russian was the first language spoken in space uh, by Yuri Gagarin, the Russian cosmonaut who was the first man in space. Okay, some of you have come up with very precise numbers, so I think maybe you've been counting uh, yourselves. Okay, let's go back to the presentation. Those were two very simple questions. I sent you away, you looked up the answers, you came back. That's an example of a web quest in its, in its most basic form, um, but obviously it can be extended. Uh, and it's a great thing to do with students in, with pair work and group work. Um, and it can be letting the students go off and, and find out the answer for themselves and then preparing to uh, present the answer, present what they've learned to the other students in English, uh, really engages all kinds of skills. It engages digital literacy, how they find out information online, critical thinking, how they, um, how they can ensure that the answer they found out is correct. Just because it's on Wikipedia doesn't necessarily mean it's accurate you would encourage them to go to different websites to check that it's the same answer on different websites. Um, and then being able to explain something to other students uh, really tests whether you've understood something or not. Quite often we think we've understood something listening to someone explain it, and we think, oh yeah, yeah, I've got that, I've got that. But then when it comes to trying to explain it to someone else, you realize actually maybe you haven't quite understood. So getting students to do a web quest where they learn something and they come back and they teach what they've learned or they present what they've learned to other students uh, engages all kinds of skills. And it could be really engaging as well. Those were two questions about language, but I'm just gonna give you five examples of things. I don't want you to go off and find the answers to these at the moment. Uh, for example, what causes an ice cream headache? You know, when you eat an ice cream and you eat it too quickly and your head starts to ache and it's, it's horrible and it takes the pleasure away from the ice cream, uh, what causes it? There is an answer, I don't know the answer. You can find it out after the webinar. Uh, another one, how are new emoji chosen? Uh, that's an interesting process. Uh, it could be, how does a sport become an Olympic sport? Another one, uh, why did moths always fly towards the light? And one that uh, lots of my students really like, how can you survive a crocodile attack? Uh, with these, I would put students into pairs or groups, put them into breakout rooms on the platform, uh, give them or ask them to choose one of these uh, things to go off and research. They go off, they research it, uh, they make sure they can explain it, and then they come back and they present what they've learned. That is a web quest. It's very simple. It can be extended uh, both in terms of linguistic uh, challenge or cognitive challenge, depending on what you're asking them to find out. Uh, it can be done very quickly. It can be done more extensively uh, with students preparing a proper presentation. Um, it's a really good way to lead into a topic. Um, and also, if the whole of the activity is done in English, uh, looking up the answers on English websites, uh, on more than one website, not only one website, uh, then talking to each other about how they're going to present it, really engages students, develops a lot of skills, and generates a lot of language, um, and is, is, is fun, and they learn something. 
Okay, those are web quests. Uh, next is a much more old fashioned activity, uh, which can be done very easily online called show and tell. Now, some of you will have seen this probably, uh, it's quite popular in the States, I think, and particularly in kindergarten, if I'm not mistaken, or primary school, where uh, every student has to bring something from home or they have to bring something from their summer vacation and they present it to their classmate. This is very easy to do online and I've done it with my students. Here's a way that you can make it, you can um, do it in class. You tell learners uh, very simply to find something on their desk or in their room or in the house that is important to them or that they consider says something about them. And it can be anything. It could be a book, uh, it could be an ornament, an item of clothing, a photo, etc. And then they're going to introduce their object to a partner. So in the, when I've done this, I put students in pairs in breakout rooms. Uh, but it can be done with a whole class as well, depending on the number of students that you have. And you can give them questions to guide their presentation. Very simply, at a low level, what is it? When and where did you get it? How long have you had it? And what does it say? What do you think it says about you? Now, I'm going to uh, present something myself. So I'm going to... Uh, let me go back to... Hopefully, you can see me on the screen. Yeah, okay, I'm gonna present a postcard. Hopefully you can all see the postcard. It's a postcard of a village in the Alps. Um, and this was, I haven't had it very long. A friend of mine who was with me during the quarantine, she came to stay uh, for a week and then Spain locked down and she was here for three months uh, with me. Uh, the quarantine ended and she went off to, to France and she was in the Alps and she sent me a postcard recently. So it's, a, it's, a, it's an old-fashioned postcard with a picture of a village from the Alps with a handwritten message on the back. Um, I, what I, the reason I wanted to show this is because uh, it's been ages and ages since I've received a postcard. And I think it used to be very common to send uh, letters and postcards, but we don't do it so much anymore because uh, we have digital communication. And my friend and I, of course, we communicate by WhatsApp and Zoom and ordinary phone calls and sometimes email as well. But I think there's nothing like getting a, a handwritten letter or a handwritten postcard. It has a as something of the person in their handwriting. You know that they've they've written it. Um, and I thought I would show you that as something uh, that uh, I think says something about my friendship with Anne, with this person, and also my love of old-fashioned ways of communicating as well as digital ways of communicating. Now I did this with my students on uh, the teenage students, and I, I thought they're not going to. They're not going to respond very well. They'll think it's really cheesy. It's kind of hokey. And I asked a group of, they were 14, 15, 16 years old to go off and find something and bring it back. Um, and I was really surprised by how well they took to it. Some of them showed uh, sports equipment. A boy showed a pair of football boots, uh, talked about his football team. Uh, a girl showed a pair of sunglasses that somebody had bought her as a birthday present. Another girl went to the kitchen and she brought back a half eaten carrot cake which she had cooked the night before, or she had baked the night before, so her mother's birthday. And she told us how she loved to cook, and the students were quite surprised that she could cook, and they asked her lots about that. Uh, and another boy who was, can be quite reluctant to take part and quite disruptive, I was thinking, ah, oh, he's not, what's he going to share? It's gonna be something stupid, or he won't do it. But actually he went away and he got a novel, and he told us that he'd had private math tuition for a while from a friend of the family, and, at the end of the math sessions, the, the teacher had bought him a novel and uh, he, were, he wanted to show that because he wanted to show that the teacher had paid attention to him, not only to teach him maths, but he had been listening to him, the kind of things he liked, the kind of stories he liked, and had chosen a novel that he thought would, would be suitable for him. Uh, and he wanted to uh, express his gratitude to this tutor. I was really surprised. It was a very simple activity, worked really, really well. Um, and can be done really quickly and really simply. And again, really engages the students, generates a lot of language. Okay, so let's go back to the presentation and we will move on. I wonder what you would show. I would like to get to ask you to show things, but we, we can't really do that, unfortunately. So here the questions are very simple. What is it? When and where did you get it? How long have you had it? And what do you think it says about you? Um, again, those questions uh, can be made more challenging linguistically and the activity can be made more difficult if you feel that's necessary. But even without making it more uh, challenging, 
the students because they'll feel they want to talk about it and they'll have questions for each other. Uh, generally, this generates a lot of language and you can respond as a teacher and help them there. Okay, let's move on to a slightly more complicated structured activity and it's a jigsaw dictation. Now, some of you probably know jigsaw uh, dictations or dictation activities from class, but if you don't, I'll explain what they are. Um, in an ordinary jigsaw, you have uh, a picture on card, which is uh, cut up into different pieces in these little shapes with pieces cut out and pieces sticking out. That's a jigsaw puzzle. And you have to look very carefully at them to put the picture back together. And in the same way with a jigsaw activity, it, you divide up a text, you jumble all the pieces up, just like the pieces are jumbled up in, a jigs in the box when you buy a jigsaw. And then the students have to look at it very carefully and together put the text back together. And this could be done as a dictation. And I'm gonna talk you through how you would do this activity. So uh, you take a simple story. It doesn't have to be a story. It can be a text of any kind, but stories work well. You divide it into sentences and then you jumble all the sentences up and then via the chat privately you share those sentences so you uh give learner one this sentence that's only nine words he says to the dog then you give to learner two you could add another woof for the same price this is a very silly story by the way then uh you give learner three a dog walks into the telegram office one day learner four this sentence woof 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 uh learner five the dog replies but that would make no sense at all learner six he takes out a blank form and writes the following messages on it and learner seven then he hands it to the clerk who looks surprised so seven students each have one sentence those sentences make up the story at the moment the other students are just uh are waiting uh, so it takes a, a couple of minutes to share those sentences uh and everybody is, is just silent for this stage then those seven learners dictate their sentences in that order to their group. So the first student uh, says, that's not, sorry, that's only nine words, he says to the dog, and everybody else writes it into their notebook. Then learner two dictates, you could add another woof for the same price, and everybody writes it into the notebook. So for those seven students, it's, it's great pronunciation practice, and for everyone, it's great listening practice as well. And obviously, if you do this more than once for a course, everybody gets a chance to be the dictator, the people, not the dictators, the people who dictate the sentences. So the seven learners dictate their sentences and then everybody has everything. They have these sentences in this order. It's still the wrong order. You then put the students into groups. Uh, depending on the platform, put them into breakout rooms, maybe three or four students in one group. And they now have to put the story in order. They have to talk to each other to decide what's the correct order of the story. I'm just gonna give you just 30 seconds to look through that before I give the answer. Uh, but obviously I would give students uh, considerably longer in a classroom to put the story back together. Um, I'll give you a clue. The first sentence is a dog walks into the telegram office one day. <clears throat> okay, let me just see if there's anything happening in the, in the chat. I think this is an activity that you do need uh, breakout rooms to do. Um, but uh, it's, a, it's an activity um, that you can use when we go back to face-to-face uh, -face teaching as well. Bear in mind that these activities work well uh, there. Okay, let me go back to the presentation. So um, if you don't have breakout rooms, this, this would be more difficult to do, uh, definitely. Uh, but you could simply dictate the seven sentences and then have students individually uh, put them back into the correct order. And it would work as a dictation activity there as well, but it would lack the element of discussion. Okay, this is the story. Um, I'm just gonna give you a second to read the story. It's very silly. Now, this is not the story I would use with my students because um, being teenagers, 
uh, most of them will have no idea what a telegram is. And probably many people listening to this have no idea what a telegram is. It's, uh, it's ancient history. Um, but you can choose a text that you feel is suitable for your students, suitable in terms of content, suitable in terms of level, um, and is as a dictation uh, activity. Okay, so that's a dic jigsaw dictation using a short text, a short story divided into sentences. Um, but uh, it can also be done with a longer text. I'll just go through the stages of that again, sorry, to make that clear. First, you divide up a short text into individual sentences. Then you jumble the order of the sentences, that's important. Then you allocate the sentences to individual learners via the chat. Then those learners then dictate their sentences to the entire group. This way, everyone has all the sentences, but still not in the correct order. Then you put learners into groups in breakout rooms. If you have breakout room function available, if not, it's, it's more, I'm not sure. Well, if not, you wouldn't be able to do this, but you could do it as a straightforward uh, dictation jigsaw with the teacher dictating and the students putting the text together. But if you do have breakout rooms, uh, you would put the students into breakout rooms and then let them work together to reorder the text. You can monitor while they do so. And they have to talk to each other. They have to talk to each other in English and decide how, how they're going to do it. And then you bring everyone back to the main room for feedback. And feedback is two things. Feedback is sharing the correct order of the story, but also asking the students um, what was easy, what was difficult, what language did they use to do it, um, did they do the whole thing in English? Uh, what phrases might they have used? For example, I think this is first, that comes next, this is definitely last, I think we should change the order of these sentences, whatever kind of language it may, may be. Um, it's not particularly important that they get the text in the right order, hopefully they will, but the point of the activity in this case uh, is mainly for them to talk to each other and to discuss how the text fits together. That's where the language, their language, will come out. So that was a jigsaw dictation, but you can also do a jigsaw reading, which is extremely similar. But in this case, you take, uh, rather than the individual uh, sentences, you have a longer text, which you divide into, um, I would normally say five sections. Four sections is slightly too few, but it works. And six sections is usually a little bit too many, but five sections works well. But again, there's flexibility. And in a similar way, this is a very popular activity in class, but it can be done online if you have breakout rooms as well. You divide up a longer text into five sections, A, B, C, D, and D. And then you divide learners into five groups, group A, group B, C, D, and D. Then you put the five groups into breakout rooms and you share one section of the text with each breakout room. So group A gets section A, group B gets section B, group C gets section C, etc. And then you give learners time to read <clears throat> and understand their section of the text and they should help each other. They should help each other uh, before they ask you for help. So they may need uh, to clarify vocabulary or the meaning of certain phrases, um, check they've understood the content um, and they help each other to make sure they've really kind of assimilated their text. Some things might not be clear because parts of the text will be out of context because it's been cut up. But as far as possible, they need to understand their text before moving on to the next section. In the next stage of this activity, you create new groups. And in each group, you need to have one student who has read section A, one who has read section B, one who has read section C, one who has read section D, and one who has read section E. Uh, and then once that's done and they're in new groups and in breakout rooms again, they have to tell each other what they read and work out the original order of the text. This necessitates a great deal of discussion. They really have to have understood their text and they really have to talk about what they've read and talk to each other and listen to each other to decide what order they think the text goes in. It's, it's quite challenging, but it generates an awful lot of language and um, you can monitor and help out and make sure they're doing this as, as much as possible in English, but there's a lot of speaking. So you've gone from a reading activity to a speaking activity that's very purposeful and generates lots of language. When they've had enough time to do that, what well, you can monitor the different groups, and when they've had enough time, bring everyone back to the main room and elicit feedback. Again, you can share on the screen the text in its, its uh, entirety in the correct order and find out whether they managed to put the text into the correct order or not. But then again, 
talk about the process. What did they find easy? What did they find difficult? Did they have the language they needed to do it? What phrases of English did they use to do it, etc.? Um, it's not particularly important that they get the text in the right order. Obviously, hopefully they will, and there's a sense of achievement if they do, but the focus here has moved from the, the reading to the speaking. So as long as they've done the activity in English and they've been speaking a lot and they've been talking to each other and trying to navigate this activity, they'll have achieved uh, a great deal. Again, this doesn't uh, work if you, um, if you don't have a breakout room, but if you do, it works really, really well. And I've tried it with students. It, it takes a very common classroom activity and uh, moves it online. Okay, we've got one more activity to look at, but before we do, I would just like to talk a little bit about activities in general. I've called this a friendly reminder, and I called it a friendly reminder because it reminds me uh, of when I first did my teacher training a long, long time ago. And uh, I remember on the very first day of the course that I did, the trainer told us that the most important thing about teaching was to remember the six Ps. And the six Ps were prior planning and preparation prevent a poor performance. So six Ps, prior planning and preparation prevent a poor performance. Uh, the idea being that um, for a lesson to work well, you really have to prepare it and plan it. Uh, and I found that to be true throughout my career, even if it only means planning it in your head. Um, lessons work well when you when you go in planned and you, and you know what you're going to do. But uh, I've changed it a little bit for this uh, webinar. I think active, activities should definitely be planned and prepared, um, especially with the vagaries of technology sometimes uh, not working so well. If you have your lesson planned and you know what you want to do and you have uh, you've thought through alternative ways to do it in case something does go wrong. Uh, that helps you to navigate the technical issues that, that can sometimes come up. They should also be pedagogically appropriate. Pedagogically, I spelled that wrong, but it should be pedagogically appropriate and correctly, <laughs> correctly spelled. Um, and uh, this means that not doing an activity just for the sake of, of um, it looking good. So not doing something because it's online, because it's a video, because it's an app, uh, because it's an online tool that allows you to do quizzes, just because it's fun. Uh, it should serve your teaching purpose rather than just something to entertain the teenagers. Um, they may enjoy it, but I do think teenagers eventually will, they do want to learn and they will respond to uh, something if they, they understand that, um, that they're learning as well as just playing. And purposeful. Uh, in the previous activities, there was the purpose of putting the text back together. And I think when students have a, a real, it's, it's task-based learning, basically. When students have uh, an objective uh, and the language comes out of trying to uh, achieve that objective, fulfill that objective, uh, there's so much more for the learners to get out of the activity than simply practicing some grammar uh, activities or doing some rote learning of vocabulary. And I think you also need to make it clear why you're doing activities. Um, quite often, there is a purpose to what you're doing, but it's not particularly clear to the students. So I think it's really important to make sure that uh, there's a reason why you're doing what you're doing and there's a purpose, and it's clear to the students uh, why they're doing it. So in the previous uh, activity with the jigsaw reading, um, make it clear to them that they're going to practice speaking by doing this activity. Otherwise, they might simply think it's a reading activity. But the real purpose is to get them to talk to each other. And if they're not aware of that purpose, they will not value the speaking part of the activity as much. But if they are aware of that's what they're doing and that's why they're doing it, they're much more likely to be engaged. Uh, they're much more likely to see the, the, they'll see the point of what they're doing. And I think it engages them uh, and generates a much better experience. So I have called these, even though I spelt one of those words wrong, um, the three Ps. So we've gone from six to three. Okay. Finally, um, hopefully some of you have been doing projects online. I like to do projects with students uh, now and again, and I think they bring out lots of different activities. Um, and I would encourage you to try to do projects online. It is more challenging to do projects online, I think, than it is uh, in a face-to-face in -face situation in an ordinary classroom. But some things that you can do online do translate quite well to the online environment. And I'm just gonna give you one example here. And it's an online museum tour. Uh, actually, lots of um, 
museums and galleries have put their exhibitions online over the last few months. So you can visit like the Prado or the National Gallery in, in London. So it's kind of, this is quite uh, topical and timely. Uh, basically, you're going to ask your students to prepare a museum exhibition. Uh, here's an example of the kind of thing they will, could prepare. There's an image of something, uh, of an exhibit. In this case, it's a jukebox and a text kind of in the, in the style of one of the little panels that you get next to exhibits in galleries and museums. Uh, and I'm going to just talk to you about how this works. So first of all, uh, learners choose a period in history, the 18th century, the 1990s or so on. Um, your idea of recent history might be very different to theirs. Um, they choose an area to research, technology, leisure, fashion, education, whatever it might be. Uh, it could be that different groups uh, research different areas. Then they go online, uh, again in breakout rooms, but it can be a homework activity if they can work together, and they choose three items to exhibit. So there's a lot of uh, online research, again, um, some digital literacy uh, comes in there. And then they work together, sharing their screens to prepare a presentation that includes images and text, like the one that I've shown you here. You need to monitor them this to make sure that they're doing the activity appropriately and not sharing things that they shouldn't be sharing. Um, but I found again with doing with students, they get quite, uh, my students, they get quite involved and they do, they enjoy sharing their screens and, sh and uh, writing the text together, choosing the images together and so on. And then they come back and they present or they take their classmates on a tour of their exhibition. So uh, they take turns to explain their exhibits, uh, describe them, talk a little bit about them. And then the other students can ask questions and then you can have a class vote on what was the most interesting or the most informative of the exhibits. It's a very simple uh, a project to set up in class and it's a very simple project to set up on, online. And again, it brings out a lot of language. It, it, with this in particular, it's, it's very good for teaching things like used to or past tenses or passives to describe processes. And again, it gets students to work together, collaboration being really important. Uh, to be discussing in English, talking in English, writing together in English, so it generates a lot of language. Uh, that's just one example. I'm sure there are other examples of projects you can do online, um, but that's one that I recommend and works well. Um, so I've gone through lots and lots of activities now. I've come to the end of the presentation, uh, and I think it's time to find out if you have any questions. I think we have a lot of questions to you then. People were shouting out here, thanking you for your presentation. It was great. That's and we cool. also thank you for staying up so late. The first one is from Natessia Gadilia. She okay. asked, then, could you share with us one of your biggest challenge, challenging situations while teaching teenagers online? Um, one of the, what has been difficult about, um, what has been difficult about teaching teenagers online, I think, is uh, at times not being able to pay. I think teenagers require a lot of attention, or students require a lot of attention, and it's more difficult online to pay uh, attention to individual students uh, unless they're in breakout rooms, for example, and you can go and talk to them. So personalizing uh, my interactions has been a little bit more difficult, and that has been compounded, I think, by in, in Spain, um, People are very chatty and they talk and they interrupt each other quite a lot. And, on, uh, and my teenagers are extremely chatty uh, and it doesn't work very well when everyone talks at the same time online. So with my particular groups of students, um, turn taking has been quite a challenge. But uh, I noticed over time that they got better at that and I was able to interact with them. And one way around it, I decided that um, it's kind of like a tick box mentality. Um, I only had... Uh, 12 students in one class, for example, but I decided, okay, today I'm definitely going to just at least ask one question to each of them. So I know that I've spoken to each of them. There's been, so there are different, also, I think um, sometimes students are very tired. They've been studying a lot during the day online. Um, and sometimes levels of motivation could be higher or lower. Um, but I found when, when we were doing activities, the kind of activities I've just shown you where they were taking part, the motivation was much higher than when I was just talking to them. Uh, do you feel that it's very different from what the previous experience you had, like on, on class uh, challenges? Sorry, could you repeat the question? 
uh, if the challenges that you face at online are very different from the what you have previously offline? Uh, well, the, te the, te the teenagers I had uh, were teenagers I'd been teaching offline. So we already had a kind of classroom dynamic and I knew their personality. Um, so uh, there was, I didn't notice much change there. Uh, however, for the summer school, uh, I had uh, students that hadn't met each other before. And I thought it would be difficult to build a class dynamic and that it would be much more difficult to get students engaged when they didn't know each other and they would be shy and so on. These were younger students. Um, but I found after a day or two, the same kind of classroom dynamics uh, were evident. Some students were more chatty, friendships were made, they were sharing their TikTok and Instagram um, accounts by the end of the course. Uh, and the fundamentally things didn't change, fundamentally. Next question, uh, Maria Klarfeld asks, do you think we should focus on content or dynamic interaction when considering engaging activities? Um, I think that uh, it depends on the content. I think content is important. It depends what you mean by content, whether it's the, the language focus or the, the topic focus. But I think offline and online, we should always try to engage our learners. We should always give them lots of opportunity to speak, um, it should be structured, the, the opportunities to speak, um, but the content alone isn't going to necessarily interest them. They have to feel a personal connection with it, I think. So um, I don't think it's focusing on one over the other, but I do think students, we should try to engage students at all times. It doesn't have to be terribly dynamic and just be asking students to respond to different questions, to share their opinions a little bit, to talk to each other. Very simple things, pair work, for example, uh, they can engage students. It doesn't have to be um, like uh, fireworks going off and streamers everywhere. It can be very simple ways to engage students. But just listening to a teacher talk for an hour is not very engaging. I'm sorry that you've had to do that, but it's, I think uh, for teenagers in particular, it's, it's, it's long. A lot of big ups from Argentina. So, Karina Salvatore from Buenos Aires, Argentina. Uh, can be Mentimeter, Mentimeter be used in some way, some other way apart from generating, uh, gener generating a collaborative poster? How? Um, with, without being able to show you how it works and without wanting to advertise it, it can. It has different options. It can be uh, do graphs with uh, different heights. Uh, there's various functions. So another one is for polls uh, where agree and disagree it kind of shows a wave. So whether it's more towards agree or more towards disagree for a group of people, there's a whole uh, range of functionality. And I, I recommend, I tried out lots of different things with my students. I think they got a little bit overwhelmed in the end. They said, you love Mentimeter. Uh, and I did, but uh, there's lots you can do with it. Uh, next question is from Moises Barbosa. My students don't feel comfortable with turning on their cameras during our online meetings. This is uh, uh, something that all teachers say, that a lot of teenagers uh, use the attend to classes with their camera off. How can we gain students' trust to avoid this? Um, this is a difficult one because for the, the, the academy where I'm teaching, it's a policy that they have to have their camera on. Uh, and if they don't have their camera on, we can call their parents and ask them to turn the camera on or, or not necessarily during the class. Um, but they have to have their camera on, so they weren't given a choice. <clears throat> um, I, I'm not really sure how to answer that question. I think it's very delicate and difficult, but I think making uh, clear that uh, it's to be protective, it's a child protection issue, that you need to be able to see uh, students as you would in real life. You, um, you need to be able to see what uh, that they're not doing anything they shouldn't be able to do, um, and making it aware to them that it's for their own benefit, even if they're shy. But I think that's something that has to be done in conjunction with the parents as well. Thank you very much. Our next question is from Marcos from Salta, Argentina. How can it be done so that students do not take inter interactive quizzes just as games? Um, I know, for example, that a really popular application or website is Kahoot for doing online quizzes. Some of you might know that. Uh, it's a you, you can do multiple choice quizzes and students pardon me, use their mobile phones to give the answer. One way to do it is again to do it as groups where students and to give um, 
a time limit for it. So for example, you have, you ask a question and the, the, the groups have uh, 30 seconds or a minute before they're allowed to answer. And that way they, they don't just jump at the answers. Um, but I think if you do it to review, uh, you do quizzes to review some things they've already studied and to reinforce what they've already done, um, even if it's kind of t testing their grammar and testing the vocabulary, uh, they'll see the the kind of the learning value as well, hopefully. Hmm. Uh, Fernando Oru from São Paulo asks, Dan, what is the importance of specific training courses for teachers on how to use all these new technological tools? Um, I, I'm not sure how to answer that. I haven't done any specific training courses, but what I have to use those tools, but what I have done a couple of times when I've been nervous about how you know not sure how to use a new uh, a new tool for so for example mentimeter is an example is um i've wrote my family in i've called my brother and other members of my family and said i want to try out something with you will you join me on zoom you're going to be my students for five minutes i just want to practice how this works um i can't say whether they've enjoyed that or not but it's definitely helped me to practice before doing it with real students i do think it's important for teachers to have training uh to feel comfortable with with um online uh, uh kind of tools but i also think students are very forgiving they i what i've noticed with the primary school children i've taught with the teenagers and with the adults is they've been very aware that this has been a learn the last few months of quarantine and teaching online has been a learning curve for the teachers as well and they've been incredibly patient they know that there are going to be hiccups that things are not always going to work um and they've, they've responded very well when things have gone wrong. They've said to me, don't worry, don't worry, we'll wait. And um, it's new. Or I, I've been really surprised by how understanding and patient they have been. So don't worry about things going wrong. Things will always go right afterwards. Yeah, it's like, I always say it's like live, uh, live blogging, live, uh, live presentations. Things sometimes yeah. go wrong and we cannot have so much how they control on it. Yeah, Thank you again. Panic. Okay. No, okay. Don't panic. Don't push the panic button. <laughs> uh, no. Thank you again, Dan, for staying up so late. Uh, would you like to give us a last phrase or something for us to remind a lot of, of the people on our chat is thanking you for this lecture? What are your um, final words? Well, I'd like to thank everyone for taking part and so being so uh, active in the chat. I didn't get the chance to read all of the comments, but I was really pleased to see everyone uh, engaged. And I, I really hope that uh, you'll be able to use at least one of those activities on your online classes. And probably to remember that fundamentally teaching online is not very different from teaching. The fundamentals are not different to teaching offline. Um, and to to enjoy it as well, as, as much as you can. Thank you very much again for your presentation, Dan. And thank you, before I say my final words, I have to say thank you for Vitor Mateus, Informed Teachers Blog, Talita Silva, Mandy Lopes, Simone Azevedo, Sabrina Zanin, Camel 2020, Felipe Gipseu and Miriam Warsman, they all come to say a hi, a big up for me on uh, Cambridge uh, University Press and Cambridge Brazil uh, Instagram. We are there talking to you and waiting for you to tag us on your posts and stories to say a little bit more how this experience has been for you guys. Uh, remember to answer our survey. A lot of you are asking about a certificate. Our amazing, lovely online team is uh, putting the link of the survey on the chat for you two guys to get the certificate. Uh, don't panic. As I said, don't push the panic button. Uh, everybody will have their questions answered. Uh, I will also like to remind you guys to donate to Food for Thought. Uh, this clear QR code here, here, uh, led you to uh, donate food for the NGO Ação Pela Cidadania, which is uh, the benefit, uh, it's, it, which is the NGO that will receive the benefit for this year action. Cambridge, they always uh, donate for one institution, and this year's Ação, por Cidadania, Ação Pela Cidadania, sorry, uh, is our institution of the year. What else? Are you curious for tomorrow's lineup? I think you are. Chana! Now you know who will be, uh, who are actually the authors that are going to be with us tomorrow. 
on the day three of our five-day journey. I see you tomorrow uh, after this video. Then we have the link for the survey to get your certificate as well. It was a pleasure and an honor to be with you. Thank you again, Cambridge University Press Brazil, for inviting me to be with you, learning so much and sharing so much content on this event. See you tomorrow.